Hi, Carlos. Hi, everyone. So we are, um, we've got Carl and we were only allowed five people on the stage at once. And I think Carl was probably the slowest person coming over. So we may have lost him. So I think Nicole's working on getting that fixed right now. Nicole, let me know once we see Carl. So I don't want to get us started um, in case we need to reset anything back here. Um, everyone was probably well aware of if you were here on, on Tuesday, we did have a couple of small technical difficulties behind the scenes that we sorted out um, while I awkwardly stayed on camera for 10 minutes and almost went into song and dance. Um, so we don't have to do that today. Um, but as I'm waiting for Nicole to make sure that we have Carl with us, I'm going to go ahead and do my intro for the sake of time. And then and then Carlos and the team will we'll pause here momentarily. And if we need to reset, we will do that. But let me go ahead and get my introduction for our first panel out of the way here. Uh, here comes Carl. There he there is. Are. Good morning. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. And Alice is here, but Alice's camera is not working. Is that right, Alice? Yeah, the camera is giving me all kinds of fit and spurts, and I just hope that we can stay connected through the whole thing. Uh, I have no idea if it's because I have two kids in the basement doing school right now or what. So I'm just, we're going to roll with it and be flexible. <laughs> Well, you know, I love having sometimes just that voice come in. It's, it's We had Corey Flint off yesterday, and as someone who's a big public radio fan, um, you know, you get attuned and attached to people's voices, and, and Alice, you and I have had enough conversations, um, so it's nice to just hear your voice, and so thanks for dealing with us with the bandwidth issues. All righty, so we have um, our first panel today um, to set us up for our second day of the symposium is going to be focusing on what are some lessons from 2020 that have shaped your view on the role of science and shaping climate change policy and the path ahead? It's going to take a lot of different angles to this talk I'm very well aware of because we have a really outstanding lineup today of folks joining us. So let me do really brief introductions of all four of our guests. We have Katherine Hamilton, who you heard George briefly there gushing about. Um, she's chair of 38 North Solutions, which is a public policy consultancy specializing in clean energy and innovation. She's an expert in smart grid technologies, advanced energy technology and policy. And as Rose mentioned, she is part of the Energy Gang podcast, which is through Green Tech Media. And Carlos is nodding, I'm nodding. We are a huge fan of the Energy Gang. It's a weekly podcast. I'm pretty sure it's weekly. I, I If not, I'm just really backlogged on my episodes. Um, <laughs> it's a really good podcast. Very energy, very energy wonky. Highly recommend it. We're so excited to have you here, Catherine. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. It's so nice to be here. Great. We also have Dr. Carl Halsker, who is a senior fellow at the World Resources Institute's climate program. He leads analyses and modeling of deep, deep decarbonization, climate mitigation, electricity market design, and the social costs of carbon. He testifies before Congress. He lectures widely on the idea of deep decarbonization, and he led the risky business study of clean energy scenarios for the U.S. And I had the pleasure of meeting Carl, I think it was last year, back when we could meet in person, and mm -hmm. also went and visited with him in D.C. as well. It's good to have you here, Carl. Good morning. Great to be here. Thank you. And we have Alice, whose voice is like the voice of God coming through your computer this morning with no face. She is uh, the president of Excel Energy Colorado, a company that is recognized as an industry leader in driving affordable and reliable service, providing clean energy choices, and in reducing carbon and other emissions. Alice joined Excel Energy in 2011, um, and I have the great joy and privilege of talking with Alice occasionally. And every time I, I leave a conversation with her, I am just so impressed. She loves to get technical and wonky, which I love. Um, so she kind of knows it all. She's such a joy. I'm so glad to have you here this morning. Alice, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Sorry you can't see my face, but we're going to roll with it this morning. <laughs> and last but definitely not least is our dear friend Carlos Fernandez. He is the state director of the Nature Conservancy here in Colorado, where he leads 60 employees and works closely with his board of trustees and partners and other key decision makers to really advance conservation. He previously led TNC's Patagonia team, and I have to say he is also a member of our Institute Strategic Council, so he's one of our close advisors, and it's always a joy to see Carlos. Good morning, Carlos. Good morning, Grisham. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. It's so great. Well, I turn this over to you and our panelists for your conversation. I'm going to bow out from the stage, and I hopefully have a great one. Thank you. That sounds great. Well, thank you, Risa, very much, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I am so excited uh, to do this. I, I have been looking forward to this moment right now because the topic of the panelists are just fabulous, and so we're off to a great treat this morning. Um, thank you for joining. So as a reminder again, 
The topic today is what are the lessons or some of the lessons from 2020 that have shaped your view on the role of science in shaping climate change policy and a path forward. And once again, we have three fabulous panelists. So let me share what you will have in mind for the next few minutes. First, I'm gonna ask each one of our panelists to in up to five minutes, so we can allow time, just to share their initial thoughts about the main theme. What are, from their perspective, these lessons from 2020 that have, once again, shaped the view on the role of science in shaping climate change policy and a path forward? Then I have a few questions I would like to ask, and then we're gonna open up uh, for everybody to ask the questions in a very open kind of Q&A. The request for that is to, given the fact that we cannot see you, um, if you don't mind typing your questions on the chat, that would be great, and Christian and I, We'll be moderating that and ask specific questions either to specific panelists or just in general to any of the panelists I would like to ask. Okay, so let's get uh, starting. Uh, Catherine, please, if you don't mind your five minutes intro of the topic of the day. Great, thank you so much. First of all, science and policy, the Institute of Science and Policy, these are two things that are two of my favorite topics and the fact that they're connected together just makes me incredibly happy and honored to be here, so thank you. Um, so as I think over kind of my trajectory to get here today, I think about how many years ago, and those there are many of us, and Carl's one of those people too, who's been working in the vineyards for a long time on climate policy and technologies. And it was for a long time, climate policy and even climate change itself was so nebulous and it was very hard for people to get their heads around what it really meant and how it impacted them. And today it's totally different. It is in our faces. It affects every single one of our lives. So the science that we've known about for years and years since the 60s really, and even in the 1800s, they were learning about CO2 impact on climate we now have it right in our faces. So I think there is this realization that all of this science is now finally connecting to what we're doing in real life. And it's becoming something that people care about and think about. And in fact, I think it was an enormous push into having previously vice president, now president-elect Joe Biden be as the incoming president. I think people knew that this was someone who was gonna focus on the climate crisis. And the reason that that was so compelling was because of the science he would bring to it. Over the last few years, I have been astounded at how what I thought was simply factual information has been pushed aside as somehow not real facts. And, I, and that has been so destructive to all of the science that has underpinned the policy that the federal government whether it's the executive branch or, or the legislative branch and even the judiciary branch, um, as well as all the states, all of these policies are underpinned by science. And I think it is so crucial that we're gonna get back to that. And hopefully this new administration will just take us to, let's think back about what our foundation is and how important science is to developing policy that really makes sense. And my sense has always been, you know, science is science, it's, it's just the truth, it's facts. And you learn more every day and you know, learn more that helps you decide what you wanna do. And you can then decide what sorts of policies to put in place, depending on what your outcome and your goals are going to be. But science shouldn't change, it, uh, it, the, the basic facts shouldn't change. So I have been very relieved in 2020 to see that people are going back to that and saying, I think we really need to focus back on what our fundamentals are. And one of those fundamentals is certainly science. Thank you so much, Catherine, very, very much. Alice, uh, what are the 2020 lessons from your perspective on the science shaping climate change policy? Oh, Carlos, uh, thank you very much. You know, first off, I just have to say thank you very much for including me in the conversation. There is so much going on in our world out there and Catherine, I agree with you. I think the focus on the science of climate change is becoming more pronounced and it's becoming something that's not out of favor. It's something that definitely people are paying more and more attention to and we're listening to. And it's it's great to be able to bring that science forward and connect it with policy. The other piece, Carlos, I would say is it connects closely with is technology. Uh, we have seen some tremendous technological advancements um, over the past several years. And I think 2020 will continue to prove uh, to be another year where we've seen continued advancement uh, in the technology space so that we can incorporate 
various pieces of the puzzle to drive that lower, um, you know, carbon emissions from the electric industry and others. One of the things, though, that I pause and I focus on in light of 2020, you know, you can't get through a day without hearing somebody talk about COVID, whether it's the vaccines that we are all hopeful that are coming around the corner, the impacts to individuals, small businesses, or various lives. But being in the utility industry, I'd be remiss if I didn't pause and reflect on the fact that we recognized even more um, in our communities and our society how essential the services are that we provide. Um, and the fact that our employees, uh, you know, along with the healthcare industry and others, we had to figure out how to continue going into people's homes, uh, whether that was because of, you know, a called in gas leak or that was because somebody has an inside meter, uh, you name it. Um, our employees were not ones that, you know, at, for our, at least our field employees were not ones that could go home and stay home with their families um, and shelter. They had to continue to be in the field. And so I think focusing on, you know, the value that they provide to our communities and our society to keep moving forward is incredibly essential. It was one of the, you know, it has been something we've known, but it wasn't something that had as much impact as what we are seeing this year. I think the other thing is, is, um, you know, preparing for these types of events is another big part of what utilities and recovery uh, institutions do. So whether that's people like the American Red Cross, where they prepare ahead of time for disasters, um, we do that same thing inside our organization. And I can tell you this, our pandemic plan um, after 2020 is going to look very different than the pandemic plan we had practiced and had ahead of time before we experienced this. Um, so it's a great learning opportunity for all of us. I think once again, we have opportunities for growth and advancement. But as far as the climate change conversation, you know, I'm looking forward to the dialogue here because we haven't stopped. Um, despite the things that have been going on here in the short term or right in front of us, we've had to continue to focus on what that transition is going to be. And that's an incredibly important part of the process. So looking forward to having that dialogue here today um, and hearing questions from uh, our audience. Thank you, Alice, very, very much. Great points as well, thanks. Um, Carl. Um, can you please share your very initial thoughts about this same topic of 2020 lessons and the science behind climate change policy? Absolutely. I have good news and I have bad news. Let's start with the bad news first. Uh, I would say that our experience with COVID uh, and perhaps what's going our, what our experience will be with vaccines next year uh, probably illustrates the fragility of scientific understanding and how it can be so damaged by those who deliberately take an anti-science point of view in pursuit of whatever goals they have. Uh, obviously we've seen we've seen that uh, with the uh, with the politicization of the whole e existence of the virus and uh, what works and what doesn't work and I think everyone in the scientific community will really have their work cut out for them trying to encourage uh, people, to get vaccinated next year when we have the vaccines fully approved and tested. So that, that fragility of, of science-based understanding and policy uh, to me is the, is the bad news. The good news, echoing I think what Catherine and Al said, is that at least on the climate change front in 2020, we continue to make progress in citizens, and uh, governments and businesses understanding and embracing the need to act on climate change. And I think that's motivated partly uh, by what Catherine said, when, uh, when things become tangible uh, as they became ever more tangible in 2020, uh, whether it was wildfires uh, or hurricanes, uh, extreme precipitation events inland, uh, that helps people uh, understand understand and be and be motivated. Um, so the, the good news in, in 2020 uh, is that uh, as as polls track people people's views on climate change, more and more Americans are accepting the science and the need for action. We're seeing more and more state and local governments taking aggressive action. We're seeing uh, businesses uh, setting science-based targets and particularly many uh, actors in the electric utility industry, like Excel, uh, set, setting targets, setting goals for uh, dramatic uh, emission reductions uh, over the coming decades. That, that is all good news. 
uh, I think it's it's also important to point out in terms of the the role of science, and I'll say that broadly, meaning good modeling, analysis, technology assessments, economic assessments. Uh, we're seeing more and more people in the climate policy arena uh, embrace the need for uh, uh, for throwing all all technologies into the fray here. I think a couple of years ago, uh, it's probably fair to say that uh, a lot more people were embracing the idea that maybe we can do this with just renewables. Maybe we can uh, solve the entire climate problem with the with the low cost solar and wind that are coming on. I see that those views evolving and I see more policymakers, more people in the NGO world uh, and in state governments in particular embracing uh, a goal of zero carbon energy. And that can come from many sources, from renewables, uh, from nuclear, from uh, gas with carbon capture, advanced geothermal, expanding hydro where we can, uh, that embrace of, uh, of, of a more technology and neutral approach to solving this, uh, which will need to keep the solutions uh, affordable and to keep our electricity supplies reliable and to decarbonize every sector uh, of the economy and not just the power sector. Thank you, Carl, very, very much. I appreciate your thoughts. Um, this is a perfect segue, uh, your, uh, you know, statement to uh, the first few questions that I have. And I would like to go to Alice. Alice, um, if you don't mind, kind of as a segue from what Carl said about the balance and about kind of, you know, throughout the decarbonization throughout different sectors, in the electric sector, you know, and moving forward, what are some of the learnings or considerations that you have found to be important? You mentioned technology as well. Can you dive a little bit deeper? Absolutely, Carlos. It's a, a great question, and I look forward to the dialogue that follows after my initial kickoff here. So for those of you who are less familiar with our company, in 2018, we made an announcement that we wanted to reach a zero carbon system by 2050 with a pause, um, or I, I guess you could say a stake in the ground of an 80% carbon reduction by 2030. And as a result of that, here in the state of Colorado, um, as well as in addition to other things, policy has continued to press forward. And so over the past year and a half, um, we have been doing a deep dive into looking at what does the grid look like in Colorado? What's the generation mix uh, going to be as we move forward um, to reach this 80% carbon reduction? Um, and in through that process, we've had a lot of lessons learned and some things that are more surprising than others, Carlos. Um, one of them is, you know, we do need a mix of resources on the system, particularly uh, because of the mix of customers we have, the demands they put on the system, um, and including the external or the extraneous um, weather events that we have that aren't frequent, but that come through. So, for example, the bomb cyclone that we experienced um, over a year ago. You know, planning around these types of events, one of the main responsibilities we have as a utility is to keep the lights on. It's that reliability aspect. The second piece of the puzzle that we follow very, very closely is the cost of our service and the, the, what we provide to the communities because that affordability really matters. I mean, another conversation that's going on broadly in addition to climate change is around equity. So making sure that people can afford our product is another piece of the puzzle that's important. When we get deep into the weeds of looking, how do we satisfy as many hours as possible with renewable energy? Where are the gaps remaining? What resources can fill those gaps? What we find are a few pretty interesting items. First off, um, wind is a great resource on our system. And wind, while it blows primarily at night, it has more consistency year round than putting solar in. Um, and so when we're talking about meeting peaks in the wintertime, particularly as we discuss more and more electrification of the system, so it may be transitioning customers from the gas system to the electric system for heating their homes, that winter time period becomes even more critical. So when you're layering in the planning for the long term, you start looking at going, oh, well, it makes more sense sometimes, perhaps, to overbuild wind and actually curtail it, which is something that people are starting to think of as going, okay, that's a little unusual, but provides a higher level of reliability for the system than overbuilding on the solar or having other resources on the system. So really one of the other key takeaways that I think people are going to have to, you know, dig into the science of to get comfortable with and that we're getting more and more comfortable with as well 
is the flexibility of the remaining resources. And that's really where this balance and this mix comes in, is if the goal is to fill as many hours as you possibly can with renewables, then it goes back to what are the problem statements that you remain having for the other hours you can't meet. Battery storage fills some of those, but not all of them because they last longer than four hours. So without technological advancements, it's not something we can fill the gaps with yet. So that then means that let's start looking at what are the other options. Mm -hmm. And some of those other options do still remain on gas. You have to have gas fired resources that are quick start, very flexible to come on the system. Now, the good news is, is that gas can be replaced with hydrogen in the future. And if hydrogen economy continues to build out, maybe that's a solution or another fuel type that goes in there that's low carbon. So you can see there's a lot of different pieces that we're digging into, Carlos, on what the filling the gaps are. But at this point in time, you really have to focus on the reliability. The reliability of the system is saying that there's a balance that you have to strike between renewables, flexible resources, especially when you're trying to meet those more rare weather events on our systems and then also looking broadly at not only what's happening on your system but you have to look at what's happening on your neighbor's system as well so we're going to become more connected i think in this future than ever and having to collaborate with each other and then really looking at and determining how do we analyze and continue to fill and progress in reaching that zero carbon future um, those problem statements and those hours we haven't been able to solve for yet. And I think that's going to continue to be a strong focus of us, of laboratories, of universities, of private entities in order to fill those gaps. Thank you, Alice, very, very much. And thank you for your leadership and Excel's leadership in Colorado. I mean, it has been just tremendous since the implementation of the Colorado Climate Plan. So thank you very, very much. Um, Catherine, uh, again, as George said, I have been a huge fan of your podcast since I discovered it, not two years ago, but more recently. And so this question, I think, is, uh, you have discovered, you have discussed it in a, couple, in a couple of podcasts, but I'm interested in, you know, we need policy that is focused both on short and long term solutions. Mm -hmm. Could you please reflect on this past year uh, as it relates to both the near and long term strategy? What lessons uh, can we take away that to be applied to climate change policy? And again, when operating crisis mode that we have seen, how does this impact long-term plans and discussion? That's uh, long-term solutions. Yeah, go ahead. I just to make sure you <laughs> it was a, it's a long big, question, huge question. <laughs> no, it's just a big question. Um, and I'm happy to so repeat any part. That's totally fine. So um, the good news is that we <laughs> have solutions today that can be implemented to address the climate crisis right now. And that is thanks in huge part to investment for decades in renewable energy, solar and wind. I was, I'm an alum of the National Renewable Energy Lab. So, you know, it's like my favorite job. So we were working decades ago on all kinds of solutions and we were even working on electric vehicles. And now look, it's, it's becoming a real market. So I think it's thanks to investment over decades that we now have those solutions at hand and we can start deploying them. And we need those solutions to be flexible. As Alice said, I, that is absolutely correct that we have all of these things, but we need them to be able to operate correctly. So we need to be able to bring wind and solar together with customer sided resources and allow the customer to be part of the solution. But what does that mean really for public policy? So if you look at federal policy, and I, and I would say you know, there's sort of two things. One is state policy and one's federal and states are moving forward apace. And a lot of them, including Colorado, are taking huge leadership positions in setting long term targets, but then executing on shorter term goals to meet those targets. I think on the federal side, we're going to see a, a real change. Um, especially in executive leadership. You're going to see um, every single agency of the federal government starting January 20th to be absolutely focused on a number of things that are in this sort of build back better platform that uh, Biden and Harris had, you know, jobs, certainly COVID that Alice was talking about, you know, making sure that whatever we do to recover from COVID also brings back the economy, that we ensure that we have equity and that we deal with the climate crisis. So every single agency is going to be focused on all of those things within their mission. So whether it's DOD thinking about national security interests, whether it's State Department thinking about how do we operate in the context of a global you know, community, whether it is GSA and how do we procure things in the federal government that are going to solve for climate, or whether it's the Securities and Exchange Commission that is going to say, 
we're going to require carbon risk disclosures of companies to just kind of see where we all are so we can all be operating from the same baseline. So I think from the administrative perspective, you're going to see a lot of short term actions. They're going to kind of get everybody in the federal government pointing in the same direction. Now, that also means you have to think about longer term. What is that? You know, longer term could mean that at least you are you're you're setting goals, even if you don't you only have a limited amount of time to execute on those. But really, the most durable solutions are going to be legislative. And that's going to be more of a challenge because I don't think everybody in Congress is in the same place on this and wants to have the same outcomes. Um, I think in the end, we can still get to the same outcomes um, without having to be incrementalists. And I think incrementalism is our worst enemy <laughs> because we mm -hmm. have a lot to do in a very short period of time and we better get to work. Um, but I do think that you can get a lot done by using science, <laughs> um, by making sure that this is linked to jobs and economic growth and development. And we're, we're lucky that we have solutions that are cheaper than dirty solutions in getting there. Um, so I think you know, there are a lot of short-term actions that a new president can take, but then on the longer term, you really want some durable solutions that will withstand over changes in administration and that can actually appeal to different people for different reasons. Thank you so much. Carlos, I'd love yeah, to build yeah. on that if I can. Go ahead. Please go I ahead. Can, I was going to go to you, by the way, but, but yeah, build on that and then I have a very yeah. specific question for you, but go ahead. Yeah. Catherine made a very important point. Uh, on 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 the on the roots of tech technology change, what we have seen in the last ten years uh, with the price of solar and wind has been phenomenal. The, the cost of solar has come down about ninety percent compared to ten years ago. The cost of wind has come down about seventy percent, and that is due to what what I would call the fourth the fourth stage of bringing a technology to market, uh, which is deployment. Uh, one thinks of the four stages of research, development, demonstration, deployment. And we have achieved economies of scale in solar and wind because we really took off on deployment the last 10 years. But as Catherine noted, the roots of that success go back even farther. It's the research and the development and then demonstrations that teed us up then beginning about 2010 for this massive decrease in cost, which uh, thank goodness, because now we can deploy solar and wind rapidly over, over the next decade and further decarbonize the power system. But then let's think about what, what Alice said, uh, her utility and others need some additional technologies, a long-term storage beyond what lithium batteries uh, can, uh, can do today uh, and a, a zero carbon uh, firm and dispatchable power source to complement a power system with very high levels of, of solar and wind, which is, is variable in its outfit. So we can't wait till 2030 or 2040 to say, gee, it'd be nice to have long-term storage or dispatchable zero carbon. We have to make sure that we are doing the demonstrations, the, the R&D and the demos of those technologies aggressively over the next couple of years so they'll be ready by 2030 uh, and beyond. And Carlos, if you don't mind, I have to jump in here too, because I couldn't agree more. Um, that is exactly what we need the investment in now, uh, just to put a really fine point on it. Here in Colorado, some of the earliest wind resources we purchased were 6.9 cents per kilowatt hour. The ones we received and signed on and brought online this year averaged one and a half cents per kilowatt hour. When you look at the solar, the first resources that we were getting were 16 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, the, the solar resources without batteries that we got this last time around were two and a half. The, the solar resources with battery stores were three cents per kilowatt hour. So you can see the huge and dramatic uh -oh. changes in cost. Now we're looking at those zero carbon dispatchable resources. You see the EU investing billions of euros into the hydrogen economy and looking at what that is. That is kind of that tipping point that you also saw with the investment in the wind and the solar to start going, where are the optimization opportunities? Where can you get more energy out of the same unit of uh, investment? Uh, those are the kinds of things that you know, cause turning points. Now, I'm not sitting here saying hydrogen is the answer. What I'm saying is that's where the investment and that cycle that Carl is talking about 
in order for us to truly hit the changes that we need. Um, you know, we can get, like I said, 80% by 2030 with existing technology. That last 20% of that carbon in the system right now, yes, there may be technologies to get there, but they are so expensive uh, for our customers to close that gap. We have to continue investing. And those are not areas that utilities invest. Those are areas usually where third parties or universities and laboratories come to the table. And we desperately need them to continue doing that research and development so that we can provide the future that we are all longing for here. Absolutely. Thank you. So, Carl, um, one more question. And by the way, to all of uh, you listening to us, I see that we have around 119 folks joining us today. Um, I would like to start hearing your questions because I'm going to ask just a couple of questions and I would like to open this up as well. And so, Carl, I, you start talking about it, but I would like to hear uh, what does a deep decarbonization look like to you? And for those of you who have not had a chance to listen to Carl in his deposition before the U.S. House of Representatives a year and a half ago, I highly uh, uh, encourage that, that we can send via Kristen some link to the deposit five, seven to eight minutes, which are fabulous to listen to Carl. But go ahead, Carl. Deep decarbonization. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to describe deep decarbonization as uh, four tasks that can be described easily but of course the devil's in the details and none of them is actually easy to, to execute. But with political will, we can do it with, as Catherine Alice, uh, uh implied, with technologies that are largely commercial now, but we will have to develop some new ones. The first, the first element of deep decarbonization is to simply be as efficient as possible across all of our end uses. We know we can make our vehicles more efficient in terms of fuel consumption, our buildings more efficient, our, our industry more, more efficient. So try to bring down the total energy needs of the economy. And there's still a lot of things we can do that make, make economic sense. The second sort of pillar of, of deep decarbonization is to electrify as many end uses as possible across the economy uh, to substitute electricity for the combustion of fossil fuels, which reduces C which emits CO2, of course. We can do that in vehicles, and we're starting to do that with plug-in hybrids and all electric vehicles, with, with uh, light vehicles, and starting to move into medium-duty and heavy-duty vehicles. We can do it in buildings. We can start using more and more heat pumps to heat our buildings and electric hot water heaters and back out the use of gasoline and, uh, excuse me, natural gas and fuel oil in the building sector and then in the in industrial sector. There are uh, some end uses that we can switch from combustion of fuels to the direct use of electricity. And in others, we could start switching to lower carbon fuels or ultimately to hydrogen, uh, a, which, which has no emissions. So be efficient, electrify the heck out of everything. And then of course the third pillar is produce a lot of electricity in zero carbon uh, fashions. And again, we've had great, we, we have lots of options. We have solar, wind, hydro, geothermal. Uh, we right now produce about 20% of our electricity with nuclear power, which is emission free. Many modelers and many policy wonks say at a minimum, let's try to maintain that nuclear fleet as long as it's safe to keep chugging out all of that zero carbon power. Uh, we also know how to produce electricity with carbon capture to take emissions way down uh, close to zero. So that's the third pillar is a growing electricity load, backing out fossil fuel uses from other end uses, but switching that power production to zero carbon. The fourth pillar I wanna, men I, I wanna mention is carbon capture. We may need some of it in the power sector. It's kind of unclear whether we need a lot or a little, maybe, maybe even none at all. But there's certain industrial processes that where we'll probably need carbon capture uh, on cement, steel making, chemicals, uh, and and some others uh, where you're not you're not substituting say renewable energy for the industrial process. And finally, uh, I hate to say it, a little bit of bad news: we need to be prepared for the possibility or even the likelihood that we are going to overshoot safe concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere 
and start heading toward a, a world of 1.5 degrees warming or higher, two degrees uh, warming or higher. And we will need technologies to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide removal is an option we need to have ready. We know how to do it with planting trees. We know how to do it with better uh, farming techniques and increasing carbon content in soils. But we also need to develop things like direct air capture and storage, pulling CO2 out of the air uh, and uh, injecting it safely underground. So those are four big tasks to do with deep decarbonization. They are all within reach with current technologies or near commercial technologies that we can envision. Thank you, Carl, very much. So I see that um, our uh, audience is asking us a lot of questions. So let me try to uh, to go to some of the questions we're getting. The first one is for Alice. Um, Alice, are utilities actively grappling due to COVID and perhaps climate in the future with any conflict between the imperatives of running a shareholder owned business with social imperatives of serving the public? Can you comment on this? No, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to comment some on it. So I think generally from a corporate standpoint, so I'll put on strictly my business hat versus my my, my physics hat right now. From a, a business standpoint, ESG is a huge topic that is looked at across um, sectors. We've seen many, many changes over the past two years uh, where people are declaring that they're moving away from uh, environmentally unfriendly activities um, in their investments and what it is that they are doing and more towards um, focusing on the easy three ESG areas. Um, as a company who is leading in the clean energy transition and really investing in doing that, we too believe that you know our investors have watched us do that. Not only it, it, is it in our, our day-to-day -day activities, but it's also in how the leadership team is evaluated. Um, the metrics that we are compensated based off of, you know, is focused on how can we hit these carbon reduction targets. So the alignment across those areas is something where I do believe that it actually reduces uh, the conflict between um, the uh, social imperatives of climate change and addressing those pieces and operating a shareholder owned business because many, many shareholders out there are looking for these types of changes in the balance. Now, what I do think is you know, unique in the utility industry is because the type of investment that we are. Uh, people do not expect us uh, to be the bold R&D changers of the world. Uh, that is not the anticipation and the reason that people invest uh, in our business. And so I do think that it goes back to the conversation that we were having amongst Catherine and Carl and myself about where um, some of these pieces of the puzzle are going and who takes yeah. on the responsibility and ownership. But ultimately, where does the demonstration have to happen? Um, and I think more and more as we get to the fringes of, um, you know, the 2030s and 40s on working down those last 20 percent, that's going to get closer and closer to the utility sector. So, you know, a long range answer to your question is I think that it becomes more of an imperative for us to invest in those riskier technologies, having conversations with regulators, the public and the shareholders that we do have about the, the risk profile shifts that will happen there are going to come, in my opinion. But I do think that where we're operating right now is still well within the bounds of the expectations um, our shareholders have, as well as um, mm -hmm. the ESG um, investment that is ongoing. It aligns very well with at least where our particular utility is operating. Thank you, Alice. This question, um, Catherine, I'm going to ask it to you, but, but please, Carl and, and Alice, I want to hear your perspective as well. The question is, do the panelists see a growing short-term adoption by corporations of voluntary carbon offsets as a way to achieve carbon neutral impacts in the short term, as a bridge to buy time for the development and implementation of the broad range of technologies that each industrial sector will need to adopt at points of emission? I find, this, yeah. I find this a really interesting question because what we see in corporates right now is like leapfrogging that. Apple, Google, Walmart, Amazon, they're all saying, yeah, we'll do that. But that's like, that's, that's just if we don't have, you know, if we have extra. But now we're doing all the scope emissions. We're trying to make sure our supply chain is clean. We're trying to make sure every single material that we use is clean. If you think about the impact that corporates can have, and I'll use Walmart as an example. Say Walmart decided in all of their superstores to only use recycled toilet paper, they would change the market for toilet paper. Um, mm -hmm. So you know they would make it all recycled. Then 
everybody would shift. And I think you're seeing these now with some of this corporate leadership that I find fascinating where they're not saying we're going to buy offsets. They're saying, yeah, if we have other things that we have to do, we'll do that. But right now we're going to focus on actually direct, direct emissions, which most of them have already addressed, but then also all of our supply chain. And it's a challenge, but if they prove out that they can do it, and then if we're if we have disclosure of what people are doing, I think that's going to go a long way and we won't have to do an sort of an incremental approach. Thank you. Alice, any reaction to that? You have been a leader in that sector. So in general, so. No, I, I have to agree with Catherine. I do believe that, you know, our largest customers, you know, the Amazons, the others of the world, uh, but even all the way down to our smallest customers, they have an imperative of they want to be there today. Um, and unfortunately, there's not enough of these resources to help everyone get there today, but there are things that you can absolutely do. The other uh, piece of the puzzle that, you know, we are grappling with internally and talking is, is as you continue to, um, we'll just call it green, the energy system, right? That the electrification pieces, where is that crossover point where people need to be the early actors or to do something special versus it's in the base. Uh, and that's been a big question that we've been having with our customers and communities in Colorado, because when you hit 55% renewables or a 60% carbon reduction, or then an 80% carbon reduction, how much more do they have to do on their side versus it's embedded in the actual environment? Um, and so that, that's a real dialogue of going, okay, many of the investments you make in wind, solar, or the other zero carbon resources, they're not just five-year investments. They're 20, 25, maybe even 30-year investments. And so if we're looking at such a dramatic change of getting to this crossover point in 2030, but you're talking about investments that are 20 plus years, what really happens with that crossover? When do people stop um, you know, really having to look for these other alternatives and it's baked into the base? So it'll be fascinating to see how these things come together um, as that supply and demand curve actually gets to a point where people are like, I'm good. Um, and so that is, you know, one thing that we'll be watching and we continue to talk about with our communities and customers um, quite a lot right now. Thank you. So I, I, I just have to know, given how often I've gone to the store and seen empty shelves uh, where there should be toilet paper, I wouldn't want to disrupt those supply chains too soon. Um, but no, uh, also building on, building on what, what, what Catherine said, I, I, I believe I would really like to see companies continue to take real action to reduce their emissions, uh, whether it's procuring uh, zero carbon electricity or aggressive energy efficiency programs, going up and down the, 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 su the supply chain uh, to reduce emissions. Uh, that is far more meaningful at this point than offsets. We, it's sort of all hands on deck. We, offsets are often uh, you know, conceived of as, as uh, uh, reforestation efforts and we, we need those on top of the dramatic decreases uh, in, in emissions. So I, I, uh, we need far more real actions uh, in addition to, uh, we, we're gonna need off, we're gonna need a lot of tree planting and soil sequestration as well. Thank you. So then the next question, um, I'm wondering, uh, I'm looking at Catherine and Alice and, and, and Carl Pritz, I mean, um, why can community-based microgrids be expanded in Colorado as in Minnesota? by clean um, electricity sooner. Anyone wants to jump into that question? I can go first and Catherine, maybe you can speak more broadly to what mm -hmm. microgrids have been doing. So what I would say is that actually in Colorado, we have more microgrids than in Minnesota at this point in time. So um, we'll have to get some, evidently we need to do a better job of communicating uh, on what it is that's going on. But as far as the experiences and what's going on with microgrids, we actually just had approved here in the state of Colorado through our regulator work with seven of our communities to build out microgrids um, in their community centers, um, namely around areas of concentration that people would aggregate um, mm -hmm. in extreme situations. So think of, you know, a massive outage uh, in the community or catastrophic. Uh, I mean, we've just all faced wildfires here in Colorado, but places where you can reinforce the system, people can gather. Um, receive resources, feedback, information, and then be able to continue to thrive in that community. So those installations are going on throughout 2021. Uh, we're really excited to partner with those various communities that came forward with the interest of having those built out. Um, and there's, there will be more coming out on that. We are absolutely looking at microgrids. How can they isolate? What can they do? What benefits do they provide to the people on the microgrid versus the rest of the grid as well? 
Um, so Mitch, more to come here as far as how do you design a system and what do you do? Um, and I think that there will be some interesting innovations that'll be coming forward, particularly as we talk about continued electrification. Um, it's like, if you think about in Colorado in the high altitude, really cold com communities, um, I think you have to start thinking about microgrids uh, more and more, not only on the electric side, but potentially even on the heating side. Um, and whether that's an alternative fuel, that's hydro not hydrogen, but it would be, um, say a propane loop or a, a gas loop itself. I think those are going to be questions we have to answer as we continue to look into deeper electrification. Thank you, Alice. I'm mindful of the time, so I'm going to go to the next question because we have more questions from uh, from the audience. But this one, Carl, I would like for you to kind of take the, the first step at it. Um, and it says, I like, and Catherine, you as well, because reference you as well, but it says, I like that Catherine brought up that outstanding amount of people who basically deny science and basic scientific facts. However, I am concerned that the denial of the pandemic negatively affecting Americans' acceptance of scientific facts, like climate. How do we combat this trend in thinking through policy, media, etc.? Initial thought, Carl. Yeah, this is this is uh, such a problem and such a tough question. Uh, and some some of uh, uh, scientists, psychologists, educators have been grappling with this for literally for two plus two plus decades. And there there are no there are no easy answers. Uh, I. I ran into this problem even uh, when I had grade school children in central Pennsylvania, and uh, the you know uh, a fifth grade teacher was was putting out uh, scientific claptrap uh, on climate change in, in a science class. So this, this hits hits home hard. Uh, places like you know organizations like the Institute for Science and Policy play a role. Universities play a role. K through twelve. Uh, schools play a role uh, to just to to fight the the, uh, the the disinformation that is that is sown by by people who uh, who actually often know better. Uh, the uh, and, and I and I think the the other real key principle here uh, that we should be aware of is you know the the, the country uh, has lots of different cleavages across. Uh, urban, rural, uh, across racial uh, lines, across um, uh, geographic lines, uh, but one of the big uh, cleavages is is in education. And often, people, uh, college educated or more, have a better grasp on whether it's climate science or the science uh, of uh, pandemics. Uh, and in uh, when any of us in our organizational settings or our individual capacities deal with someone who doesn't get it, I think the absolute most important principle is to deal with other people with respect and to never uh, humiliate them or look down on them or, or disparage them, but, but to, this is a, a giant task of winning hearts and minds uh, with respect and with love of our fellow humans. Thank you, Carl, very much. Catherine, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just, thank you for, I agree with Carl. And I also would just add that this has a lot to do with leadership, um, where you have leaders that are all in on science and are making it an issue of public health and safety. I think people follow follow the leaders. And so right now with COVID, it's it's very much about local and state leaders. And there's been some amazing people of all political stripes who've shown an incredible amount of leadership. And the people in communities that they serve are following that leadership. And I think that's really important. I think it needs to come from the top. So when it gets from the top, when there's an acceptance at the top that COVID's real, that the climate crisis is real, I think that will help filter down as well. But I think about my family is from Southern Virginia. My brother lives in Appalachia and uh, on a Zoom call for Thanksgiving because we didn't go there. You know, he said, look, my part of the state is extremely red. And, you know, you hear that there's all this division. But he said, you know what? There's not a division on masks. We all wear masks because we all know it's a matter of public health. And that is because the state and local leaders and the state have been very clear on health and public safety. And I think that is going to translate because of science and because of the, the facts that have to underpin everything to the climate crisis as well. And that's what gives me hope on understanding that we can bring everybody along. And we have to be intentional about it. 
And we have to, as Carl said, be respectful and allow people to chart their own courses and their own pathways. But that is something that we should not give up on because I think no matter whether you're in the reddest rural district in the in the country, you have a stake in what happens to this planet. And, and there is a way that you can participate and chart your path to a clean future. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm gonna ask the last, I'm mindful of the time and I want to give you, each of you, a one minute kind of uh, final uh, closing remark, but I want to ask you one more question uh, before, and that is, again, going back to climate, given the, the, the global collective action challenge that we're all discussing that climate will take, can you please share with me, where do you see leadership opportunities at the local, state, national, or global scales? Anyone would like to start first? Mm -hmm. I'll jump in. Go ahead, <laughs> Alice. Well. <laughs> so I think Catherine and Carl, you both have a, you know, a broader perspective and things that you can bring to the table. So I'll start small and y'all can take it really, really big. Um, so, you know, I do think that it takes each of the state's actions moving forward. You know, in the past several years, we haven't had the federal leadership uh, in order to cohesively move forward um, in the recognition. However, I do think that states have continued to press forward, Colorado being one of them. And here in Colorado, with the legislation that was passed in 2019, you know, both for the industry-wide carbon reductions, you know, 50% by 2030 and 90% by 2040, plus focusing on the electricity sector and setting up the pathway for us to make progress, I think we are making tremendous progress. So I think Colorado is leading, and Carlos, just to put a really fine point on it. By March 30th of 2021, our utility who serves the majority of uh, Colorado has to bring forward a plan that shows the commission the pathway that we can take in order to achieve that 80% carbon reduction by 2030. And what that is going to have is tons of levels of detail, science, technology, everything involved in the modeling there to look at what is the mix of resources on the system? What is the reliability outcomes and expectations? And what are the cost impacts all in one place? So I think it's important to recognize that we have agencies, we have states, we have support in order to look at what that future looks like. Now, whether the initial plan that we put out there is the one that's ultimately selected or something better comes forward through going through the stakeholder process, that process alone is one that I think can be used as an example of for other utilities, for other states, for other nations, quite frankly, on how do you evaluate this system how do you bring it together and look at achieving these goals in a time frame that matters? Because these outcomes will not only meet, but they will exceed the Paris Accords um, through all the studies that we've had done by third parties. And so that is the right direction to be on. And I think a true example of leadership, because it's not just about Colorado in this instance. Yes, it solves much of the problem for here, but it is a pathway for others to copy in order to be successful in their own regions. Absolutely. Well said, Alice. Thank you very much. Catherine, Carl, your reactions? Go ahead, Catherine, if you, if you wish. Thanks, yeah, I totally agree with Alice. Um, I, I work a lot within the context of the World Economic Forum. I've served as a council chair for a number of years. Right now I'm co-chairing the Council on Clean Electrification. And just looking at the rest of the world and what everyone is doing, it is so crucial that we become back into that conversation and that we can show leadership there. It's just, our voice has been missing and it's created a vacuum that has not been helpful. And I think that getting us back into that global dialogue will allow us to bring all of these actions that have happened on the state and local level to the forefront as we think about globally, how do we lead on the climate crisis? Thank you, mm -hmm. Catherine. Carl? And a quick uh, wind up, as I think you mentioned, uh, leadership opportunities, the local, state, national, international levels yes all all of the above is the easy is the easy answer but i but i mean that sincerely in the sense of uh this cannot be solved just by the right international negotiations this cannot be solved just by one nation or several nations having the right national policies there are steps that fit best at different levels at the local government level what is your city doing to encourage uh, the installation of uh, vehicle recharging uh, hardware? What is your city doing to encourage the general phase out of, uh, uh, of natural gas appliances and the substitution of, of electric appliances? What is your state doing in terms uh, of a renewable portfolio standard or a clean energy standard? 
What are groups of states doing to build transmission uh, across state lines so we can wheel uh, uh, wind and solar more freely? What's being done at the, at the national level in terms of uh, standards that make sense at the national level, car standards, light bulb standards, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a game of multi-dimensional dimensional chess mm -hmm. and there are opportunities for you, the audience, to play uh, at all those different levels depending on what you do in your job and what you do as a citizen. And then going back to one of our themes, each of you in the audience should make sure that your school district uh, or your college is bringing up scientifically literate citizens and voters. Thank you, Carl. Um, for the time that we have, I want to be mindful, but any last parting thoughts from each of you in uh, in closing this panel? It has been an absolute pleasure really listen and learn from all of you. And thank you, Christian, for the opportunity. But any other one minute parting word from each of you on this topic? <clears throat> Sure, I would jump in quickly and just say, um, I'm an eternal optimist <laughs> and I continue to be an optimist even though uh, you know the, the, the thought of the climate crisis and what could happen is absolutely terrifying. Um, and I think this is just a tremendous opportunity. It's an opportunity for everybody to benefit. I think we don't have to do without. The US is the home of innovation. And I think that, and, and Colorado especially, is a hub of innovation. And I think we all have a role to play um, and I think it's going to pose tremendous opp opportunity for everybody. Thank you very much, Catherine. And I'll pay Alice, on yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, I agree. Uh, I too am an optimist. I do think that, you know, if we can clearly state uh, what the gaps and the problems are, we can get really smart people working on those in order to close those in a timely fashion to be successful. And I think that, you know, there are, it's just purely an exciting time to be in this industry. To have this opportunity, um, you know, I think many, many people in the world out there want to make a difference. And in this industry and what it is that we are working on, we truly have that opportunity to make a difference um, in our communities, for our customers directly, but for society in general, which is a great um, feeling uh, to be able to go to work and look at those things every single day. So if you're not in the energy industry and working on these things, get into it. It's a lot of fun. It's inspiring. It's a great time. Lots of innovation going on um, and really hard problems to solve, but worthwhile ones to spend your time on. Thank you, Alice. Carl? I don't think I can add much to those two eloquent uh, roundups other than that I, I share that optimism. We know how to solve this. Well, all we need to do is exert the political will and, uh, and, and get the right policies in place, and we will solve this problem. Thanks a lot, the three of you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I would just close to say that, you know, this is an exciting topic. It's a key topic. Climate change mm -hmm. is the most important threat to any of us working on the environmental uh, uh, movement. Please join us. It's a huge topic, but you can see I, 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 I fully join the panelists in the in, in being an eternal optimist. We can tackle this. This is literally the last decade that we need to make a big difference and 2020 the first year of the last decade was a very challenging one with the world pandemic but we can still do this so please join the environmental movement no matter who you support join some of these actors and stakeholders it is really key to have only one planet and starting an event like this one is a very good way of doing it so thank you Christian, back to you it has been a pleasure Kristen's muted. We cannot hear you, Kristen. That's because I kept myself on mute, you know, someone who's done this a million times. Um, Carlos, I was just saying thank you to you. You are a leader here locally and in our state and, and, and beyond that, too. And so we're very thankful for you getting us through this beautiful conversation. An hour goes by so fast. Um, and I, I just always wish we could just sit here and listen to all of you speak because you have tremendous expertise and insight and wisdom and you're just a joy. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carlos. I realize there's a lot of cuz there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's been such a pleasure. So thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to take just a minute or two here to direct our folks, but if you all want to pop off, we are very grateful mm -hmm. for you. So thank you for joining us this morning. Thank Thanks you. Thank you all thank so you. much. Appreciate hey, it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.